Hello and welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. Today we are speaking with Fabian Kremkus. During his 25-year-plus career, he has worked nationally and internationally on academic and research facilities, secondary schools, hospitals, corporate headquarters, sports and entertainment facilities, major museums, performing arts centers, research facilities, healthcare, higher education, and justice facilities throughout the country. Fabian is enthusiastically devoted to the profession and craft of architecture. He holds both a Master of Architecture and a Pre-Diploma of Architecture from the University of Brunswick, Germany, is how I'm going to commit to saying that. Brunswick? Brunswick. Brunswick, Germany. I'll go with that. Uh, he's got a very interesting background in that he actually worked as an apprentice carpenter in Europe and Germany before becoming a designer, which shows that he's got some tie to the practice before he tries to design something or other people have to build what I think is really interesting. And he's uh, done the country's first all-electric hospital in California, I believe, UC Irvine, potentially. So this should be an interesting conversation in that sense. Give it up for Fabian Kremkus. Fabian Kremkus, welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, where are you at? It looks tropical in the background where I where I saw earlier. It's not really tropical. It's Los Angeles, um, big city, uh, and really yeah. dry right now. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I'm in Maine, so we're we're a little more German with our environment over here currently in the uh, 16 degrees and everything frozen. So. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, that is cold. Yeah, my son was actually trying to get me to walk out on our pond with him this morning to see if he could play on it while I'm gone. And I'm kind of like, I got to go, buddy. Don't go in the pond. Not a good idea. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That's fun. I love uh, playing hockey. How long have you been in California? Since 95. Uh, I came here in 95. Uh, I had just finished yeah. school and worked a little bit in Germany. And then I started. I came here. And I'm, I'm very interested in uh, your experience having kind of traversed cultures, which I think will be an interesting thing to hear about. And it sounds like you were intentional about learning about the construction trade and being a part of it before you were actually at the point of designing the things that people are going to have to build as well. That is true. Uh, so I I come from a family of craftsmen and um, my grandfather was a mason, my dad was a mason too and became then an architect and I went after high school to become a journeyman carpenter and I did that and worked a little bit as a carpenter as well and then went to architecture school in Germany in Braunschweig which is one of the you know more well-known schools in, in Germany besides Berlin, Darmstadt, Stuttgart, you know. And so... I spent some time in Darmstadt at a school. Uh, I went to architecture school in Michigan, and we did a summer abroad in Italy, Austria, Switzerland, and Germany. And I think we spent a fair amount of time in Darmstadt, if I'm not mistaken. But it was... Well, there's a Stadler school in as a Stadler school in Frankfurt that had like a natural affiliation with some of the schools in, in the U.S. But, you know, it may have been, I don't know if it was that. But there's, there's programs where exchange. ETH Zurich has like a pretty vivid exchange program with America, with, I think with Harvard and uh, some of the other Ivy League schools. Okay. Now, why, why the choice to actually do a journeyman or apprenticeship in carpentry before going into design school? Did you know that you were going into design school and that was prep for that in some way? Or did you get into carpentry and then realize you wanted to go into design? That's more like it. So the carpentry shop that I worked at was like doing doors, windows, and light renovations, like interiors. So it was not the traditional framing carpentry. It's more like finished carpentry. And uh, gotcha. the shop was run by a woman. Uh, and the son, um, he just had started architecture school when I started working there as a young apprentice. 
and uh, over time we became closer uh, and became friends and he took me then to go see the school and it really made me interested uh, more and more and you know then later on this relationship developed and we designed things together as actually in the shop uh, and made those things in the shop and then it was kind of a natural thing for me to progress to go to architecture school. And I went to the same school he went and it was like a wonderful experience. It was really like great. And it uh, set me up with a skill level that I could use while I was studying. You know, I made money uh, in the spring break always to spend that then in the summer on travel, uh, working as a carpenter or as a craftsman. I, I made friends with a guy in a metal shop too that, that I worked at. So I always worked with my hands and I, I find that enriching, and to this day, I enjoy doing that. What well, have you put much thought into? What the fulfillment from actually working uh, with your hands and having something at the end of it? What, why psychologically, philosophically, why there is that value there? Because I I really agree with you. I made a, a coat tree like uh, two years ago. I I needed something near the door for a coat tree, and I just hadn't built anything since really like architecture school. And it was around Christmas time. And I took like two weeks and just very meditatively worked on this coat tree. And at the end of it, it, it was very cathartic and fulfilling for me to have had made something with my hands that was real from scratch that uh, did something for me. I don't know exactly what, but I really appreciated it. Um, what, does it what does it do for you and what is the value that translates into what you get paid for doing? I think the the biggest thing is to um, kind of understand yourself a little better when you kind of go out there and draw things. Uh, in the computer, you can make everything hang in midair, right? Like, so there's no gravity, there's no kind of physical loss, there's no... Um, limitations in a way uh, uh, of what can be done. And um, this kind of is a grounding experience uh, in a way to actually do mm -hmm. things with your, by yourself. Uh, and also the appreciation of people that actually do this for us in the field all the time, right? Like they have to do this uh, on a daily basis what we put, where we put the mouse to the virtual world uh, now, it's not any more pen to paper. Um, we are, had, that's a responsibility that we have to create something that somebody else actually can, is able to make and understand. And uh, I think to remain close to that and have a relationship to it is really important. And um, translating what you do in your mind with your hands is an act that is kind of taken away from us uh, in many regards. Uh, we go to the restaurant, we don't cook ourselves anymore, and we kind of like, mm -hmm. we don't do the things anymore that we actually n needed to do many centuries ago. And it's, uh, it's something that's ingrained in us, I believe, and that's why it's so satisfying to do it, right? Like, it's really satisfying to cook a meal, it's really satisfying to make a little sculpture or to do some pottery or do something with your hands. And I think it is a very grounding thing for us and it's good for the soul. What do you find uh, different in the culture from Europe to America as far as the relationship between designer and those who actually build the project uh, for, the, for the, essentially the client? It, it seems from, from the American perspective, having been on both sides of the pond, photographed on both sides of the pond, worked and designed on both sides of the pond, that there's a, a deeper value and appreciation for that, uh, that skill set that goes down to the foundation of where what we have comes from. So the people that are actually building it seem to have more protection and respect in Europe than in America. In America, it seems like we have more of a 
refining down to very isolated purposes. Like our food is isolated down to very refined things that we can make a lot of profit off of. And there is a loss of grounding in that, if you will. In Europe, they have more of a connection with their food, actually a culture where there is more of an enjoyment of making the food together, enjoying the food together rather than driving through, getting it thrown in your car and drive on to the next thing where you make money. Um, it, it seems to me like there's a very different uh, way of valuing and relating in America than there is in Europe. Do you have any experience uh, or opinion to shine on that, you think? Yeah, I, I mean, it's... I hate to generalize it, right? Like, because that's, uh, it's really not fair to the people that sometimes are extraordinary craftsmen. They exist on both sides of the, uh, both sides of the, of the pond, uh, like you said. Sure. Um, uh, but what I think what is, what I encountered here that, um, made me kind of like stop that there's, there's a level of um, of sophistication and craftsmanship that you can it, it's much easier to access in Europe than there is here, and uh, because yeah. that's goes back to the way that guilds and um, and and trade unions were established, and it's the, they are deeply rooted in tradition, which can also be annoying, uh, but there's also a a, a very good. Um, level of education for uh, for craftsmen still exists right like people go into that profession and they want to be a carpenter or they want to be a plumber and they stay a plumber all their lives and they are not kind of looking for the next best thing and so they kind of improve uh, what they do over time and uh, that's a valuable thing i'm not saying that that doesn't exist here but there is a yeah. level of um, of pride sometimes in the trade that I find that hard. At, at times, I find that here like tough to get the level of quality that one can achieve and and uh, in Europe fairly easily at times. Yeah, it seems to me from my experience between California and New England and Europe, New England is pretty much right in the middle. Uh, the the obsession with craftsmanship and the quality of construction that you can find here in New England is is really amazing. Uh, and then when I look at more of uh, in in general, and then when I look at the general take, not to generalize, but uh, ar- across the rest of the country, it, it does drop a little bit. You can always see spikes in any state in any area where there's really high craftsmanship and really uh, people who are intensely talented and passionate about it, but in general, yes, it there's there's this difference of the quality that you can easily kind of reach your arm out and grab what you need for your project. I'm wondering, like, why is that cultural difference there with America? It's like you said, the guilds in Europe and everything else provide maybe a little bit more difficulty to change a building practice, where in America we can change more quickly and maybe we reward newness and change a little more highly in the U.S. And that's the trickle down that we get is you have less established long-term craftsmen that stay with a trade for a longer period of time, maybe. Not sure, but it's a, it's an interesting thing to kind of dance around with someone who's had the experience going between two societies, if you will. So, yeah, I mean, like that, I, I, the steel fabrication, for example, in Great Britain or the glass fabrication in Germany, you know, like or in France you know, that you can get, it's just amazing. And they uh, are able to export that expertise, you know, globally in a way, right? Like, so the, I think Hong Kong Shanghai Bank was entirely crafted in Great Britain, and then put on a container ship and put up, uh, and was mm-hmm. built uh, to be able to disassemble it once Hong Kong reverts back to China. Well, that hasn't happened, but <laughs> it's an interesting well, that, little, little thing, that, right? Yeah. Like, really, that's really interesting that you make that statement because if I point about two blocks right over here, like if I'm pointing, it's right there, two blocks that way. 
there's a big old masonry church here in our town of Bitterford, Maine, that has all the stained glass is from Germany. And back in like early 1900, uh, it was made in Germany, put in a ship, brought over, put up in this church. And they had me probably about 10 years ago photograph all the windows in the church. The church is no longer in use. It's sitting vacant. But just the windows themselves are worth a million dollars, supposedly. But they just can't figure out how do we get them out and how do we get them sold. And, and that's really interesting. The, the main thing everyone says first is like, well, they're made in Germany. And that's a big, you know, like. <laughs> well, that's, so. yeah, yeah. That's a, you know, that's a sign. But like. You know, firms like Glasbau Seele, they do most of the Apple stores, right? Like it's a German firm mm -hmm. and they have made this niche in the market um, that were able to kind of elevate that craft of like making large format glass and, and drilling and cutting it in a way that nobody else can do on the planet, right? Like it's like mm -hmm. really quite remarkable or well, very few. Oh, I mean, I wouldn't say not, you know, that but there's this like elevation of, um, of fabrication that happened that is, I think it's rooted in that tradition. Um, and I don't think that, I think it exists here too. I think like the, probably the mass timber um, fabrication that kind of is championed in Canada and in Oregon and stuff like that, that's like way up there in terms of what, what people are able to to do you know interesting now i've i've been made aware that you still sketch with fountain pens why would a person do such a thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i love the feel of it and, and like i have a little collection not much you know i use just one type uh, but i think it's uh it, there's nothing that flows like a like a fountain pen when sketching Right, like so, it's like it has this like wonderful feel, even on, and it doesn't matter like parchment or, uh, I mean the sketch paper or in the sketchbook. I think it's still, it's a really nice thing. It's kind of this physical experience that you don't get from anything else. Yeah, it it has that feedback in your fingers. That's that little bit of grain and grit that you get between the paper and the pen that adds that resistance that you can push against and know when it releases and how that turns into the curves on the, on the page and everything else is so horrible when you try and do that on an iPad. Have you tried to sketch on an iPad and the pen tip just slips everywhere and it... Yeah, it's not the same. It's it. not the same. I, I like the iPad too, but uh, I prefer if I... If I don't have to, if I can, like do it just with a pen, it's really nice. I I love that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I do it not enough anymore because it's kind of the you have to always communicate, right? Like so, then you have to take a picture, put it up, and it's kind of like it's too many steps, right? Like so, drawn directly right. on the Moreau board uh, is kind of super fast and. Uh, I like right. that too. I mean, I and I think those skills, though, the hand sketching that you learn, and it doesn't matter like what pen you use, doing it enough, it directly translates to uh, to the electronic media too. I, I yeah. I, you can tell that like if somebody has a, you can tell if I draw a line, it has a certain hand, right? Like it's get a little bit jittery, and it's like it's just like who you are. And, right. you know, so I, I love that about drawing by hand because it's a reflection of the person. Yeah, there's still the uh, translation of the physicality of the human that translates into what you actually see, where there's less of those, those feedback things uh, in when you're sketching on an iPad. In my opinion, there's, there's less. There's yeah, less, less, less uh, for sure less. Yeah, it's weird. There, there's more of an interpolation by the computer that eliminates the person-to-person -person communication that you actually get with paper and fountain pen. Okay, that's that's where it is. All right. Good. All right. Solved that. <laughs> um, now, what is uh, what is your idea of the value of hands-on work now that we're entering into such a virtual existence? 
if I just, you know, look at it, it's, it's the respect for the physical world uh, it, that it teaches you, right? Like how hard, if you know how to make a chair out of wood, okay? If you ever tried doing that, how hard that is to actually do that, you know, with all the little curves, like a, a toenail chair, like try to make a toenail chair by yourself, right? Like that is a very tall order. And uh, the respect for those physical objects that surround us um, can only be experienced if you actually have to try to create one yourself. And uh, I, I think that's a, it's a fundamental um, experience if you, have, if you try to make something uh, that like you can see how difficult it is to like even paint a wall really nicely, evenly. Uh, it's not an easy thing. So, uh, you know, or do the drywalls and no, none of the screws show up and nothing and it's super smooth, right? Like that's not easy to do. And lots of people, they just bang the chair in the wall without thinking about it. And it's a, uh, it's like a, this has somebody has spent a significant amount of time creating that and it, it deserves uh, respect uh, and appreciation. Just like a plant that has grown over time or a tree or something that has been made by us. Uh, I think um, that's uh, what it teaches me or what I like about it. Uh, I have a deep appreciation yeah, for design and uh, and the the craft of making that and like I can see what it takes to do it right like right. I wonder how much the experience like so you graduated architecture school in the mid nineties you'd said yeah yes so I I graduated architecture school in two thousand three so right as I was coming out of school smartphones and the internet were really hitting their stride smartphones most more so like around 2005 to 8 um but the the cultural change and the day-to-day -day existence change with that introduction to me um has supplanted so much of what you're talking about as far as the hands-on learning hands-on person-to-person -person communication, all of it is just becoming so incredibly uh, virtual, our entertainment, our information, our, our food at the level of, you know, um, drive-ins and everything else. It's so uh, quick and passive to get to the whatever it is that you're actually wanting to do while you're quickly and virtually passing by all your moments of life that you don't get that hands-on, slow down, this takes more time because it's more difficult, you just can't just have it now and move on. Um, to me, there's something in that value of the handmade process of doing it yourself, like you said, valuing the difficulty of making a chair, like you can make a chair <coughs> hold up a person very easily, but it's probably gonna be pretty thick and glommy and not very graceful. I can just carve out some two by fours, tack them together. It'll hold a person up. Might not be comfortable, won't look good. So when you get that balance of actually having to like, let's put a cant on the back of the chair and curve it. And all of a sudden you're into all the weeds of difficulty of the design, the process, how it goes together. And you're not just clicking a button on Amazon and it's coming like two days later. And when it's trash, you throw it away and you move on that that the majority of our population seems to be going that way. And for, I think, I don't know if I landed right at the spot where all of my adult life was pre-internet and cell phone, smartphone, to then adult life, that transition into all that I do and I act with is now just for me to decide as an adult, rather than learn through childhood how to handle this new thing and then learn, I think that's why we have such a push recently in the U.S. for more of this hands-on, handmade craftsmanship. I think that there's think. definitely a generational um, uh, change happening. I mean, I've like um, I see that that some of our younger staff 
gravitates to making things. Uh, yeah. Uh, and yep. so they m have missed it and they want it. And um, also a lot of schools, um, my niece just started architecture schools and in the first year, um, they don't use the computer. It's all done by hand. They have like sculpture studios and they have to draw by hand. All their projects will be by hand. There's a very modern theory taught, but they not getting to model until they are uh, in the second year. Mm, that's, uh, can I, I want to go do that. <laughs> <laughs> that that was interesting i was like i was like you gotta get a computer you gotta get a machine that can handle you know uh, a, a fairly good sized model in rhino and you know you should do this that and the other and i was wrong <laughs> i uh, was that wrong because she really should have waited to get the computer because the machine will be a year old by the time she's gonna start actually really right. using it you know like uh, so hey <laughs> that was kind of good news to me to see that happening yeah, though, yeah. regardless uh. yeah i think if if you're going to be a designer as you've modeled with your life getting that idea of learning the foundational works that lead to a well-informed person actually leading the design pen that it's you know an idea of how these things go together and the difficulty of it passes that respect down the chain towards the more foundational things that bring our uh, creations into being. So, yeah, yeah. I think Pratt Institute uh, in New York still follows all of those uh, principles to teach composition. It's all. It's a lot of it is just uh, working with your hands. I think there's very yeah. little that they do in the computer in the two foundational years. So it's, uh, it, yeah, it, it right. still exists. I mean, it, it's not that that's completely gone. Right. Yeah, I think my generation coming out right when I did jumped right into, hey, look at all these things that have all these benefits. But we didn't have the experience to know the downside at the time as much. So it's kind of this harder learning curve, I would imagine, uh, towards the wisdom of when and when to not use it and how much to engage your previously held talents that allow you to do what you do to not let them go, you know? So, um, so I imagine this kind of thinking is what led you to be the head of the 3d printing and modeling shop at your firm. Yeah. Like, I mean, we, we kind of like always had a model shop, uh, but, uh, we now have some, we, we have somebody that we hired that runs it. And it has like um, increased the amount of output and engagement of people with the shop also in this really significant way. It's wonderful to see it. And um, we're, by the end of the year, we will have a CNC mill also uh, okay. that will be, you know, fairly significant in size so we can actually uh, mill in house, um, which is great. Um, and we have kind of like a real carpet, the set of carpenter tools and uh, like a real bench. And it's not used very much, but at times, you know, like uh, those things are used. And um, it's been great to see that people have, you know, more and more taken interest in it. And it's also nice to see that there's a combination of like making it just straight by hand and then using all of the digital tools, right? Like, so we farm out some of the printing, the 3D printing, we print in-house, we have a few 3D printers in-house, and um, we have a large laser cutter that we that's used fairly regularly, and uh, and now we will add a 3D, a 3D mill, like a Laguna tools, kind of like, uh, very substantial it can change the tools right? like it's auto tool changing oh nice nice yeah yeah it'd be cool i mean uh, i'm excited about that <laughs> it's always good to have something that you can kind of uh geek out on a bit um how do you find clients respond differently to actual physical models compared to virtual models i think it's uh there's a deep understanding that everyone has 
or when you look at a physical object that you cannot replace with uh, with the image and even with the VR experience because that's also kind of like it's different uh, and I'm not saying this is the one replaces the other but there is this uh, nature of making a prototype of something right like be it a small one a miniature of something or like a one-to-one -one physical object that is you know, we built like a patient room, for example, sometimes or an exam room just out of cardboard one to one. It's kind of like simulates then the spatial relationship for the staff to walk into. Right. And, oh, okay. and, and so oh, okay. now one to one, you mean life size? Yeah, life size. You know, so oh, you're like, cool. interesting. So uh, and then eventually it will be a full on full scale mock up that's almost functional. Right, like so, like for UCI, for example, for the new academic medical center we're doing there, they have an, they have several exams rooms types and the patient room and an OR build a full scale mock up uh, with all of the finishes, wow. all the furniture, all of the booms and uh, medical equipment in it. It just doesn't work, right? Like they can't start right, operating right. in it. All right, like so air doesn't work the water is not connected but you know all of the fixtures and things are in there uh, and it's literally making a real life full-on prototype and uh, it's uh, super valuable um, now when you when you do that in this way how do you uh, is this built in the place where it's going to be or is this off-site and then you bring clients there to experience it? It's in a warehouse. Wow. Up a whole like operating room essentially and then the doctors and nurses come and give you feedback through and do they walk through kind of how they would use it and ah, the elbow space here isn't. And... That's right. That's wow, what happens. Wow, okay. Ah, okay. Interesting. What are the what are the kind of things that you learn from that experience that you can't get from a model that have been very valuable? And so, so typically, what happens? We have also a full on VR simulation of the same space, right? Like, okay. so all of the kind of general spatial arrangements can be flushed out in that, and then it's really kind of like, is that outlet in the right spot? Is the boom kind of fit and finish, you know, to the expectations. It's more than about like really refinement. And also for the team that actually builds this later on in the field, be able to kind of like have a one-to-one -one experience making it that they can then just replicate in the field. So they know where all the problems are, right? Like connecting all of the conduit, like do we have enough room here in the wall? Is the wall thick enough? Is there, uh, is there any issues with, uh, um, with you know, the stud layout? You know? So every metal stud is in there. So it's like you, you can literally, they'll move a stud an inch or so back and forth, uh, and then that gets manifested and, and then later on replicated. Wow. So wow. it's more about the constructability in the end and kind of fine tuning it rather than yeah. uh, like making bolder decisions. That would be in a cardboard mock up or in a virtual mock up, right? Like where you say, oh, okay, we need to move the boom three foot over because it just doesn't work how it relates to the door and like how we get in and out of the room. Um, so those things are flushed out um, early on. So it sounds like you would go from virtual model to a uh, smaller scale model and the decisions at that point are less uh, buildable functionality issues and mars far more so the aesthetic and gestural uh, aspects of the design. Yeah, the color. And then when you the, get, when you right. And when you get to the one-to-one, -one, it's like, do you have the team that's going to be constructing it? They're actually building the one-to-one -one model so that's they know how to do it when it comes. That's cool. Interesting. So this is like in architecture school when I do my whole presentation and then I'd lose the entire thing 
and I'd be able to redo it in like one hour where I had lost eight hours. You remember how that would happen with old? That's right. That's the very yeah, same, that's interesting. very same concept, uh, just on a more complex, uh, uh, a more complex situation, right? Like, and so a lot of that has gone away in a way because now you can simulate a lot of the things in the virtual world. So this has become kind of condensed and some clients don't even go anymore to the, through the expense because it's also very expensive to do that, right? Like you have to rent the warehouse space. All of the trades have to be pre-engaged to do that because it's typically completely out of sequence from the actual building. So you have to have the contractor on board way before and then all of the trades have to be committed to actually do the actual work in that warehouse, right? Like you can just imagine the, 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 how quickly the money flows out the door doing that. And so you'd probably only do that with highly specialized technical rooms. Yes, and uh, large projects where there's a lot of repetition on a type, right? Like so. So this had 23 ORs in it and it has like 150 patient rooms. Wow. So they like, so there's scale matters in that way, you know, like that's, uh, that's when it's kind of beneficial and it actually pays for itself down the road. So the, the project that we're roughly speaking around is this UCI health in Irvin, Irvin medical center. Yeah. In and Irvine. that's, that's the country's first all electric, uh, standalone all electric hospital. Is that, am I saying that right? Yeah. It's, uh, it doesn't have any more natural gas to make hot water or cooking. So, okay. so what that means with the grid in California becoming more green, uh, right? Like, um, by basically, I, I hope by 20, 35 uh, here in California, we're probably at 95% um, uh, energy all from renewable resources because solar and wind power they're heavily invested in and it, it might happen, you know, keep your fingers crossed, Trent. <laughs> so yeah, then so a facility like that would basically, you know, be uh, operationally carbon neutral because all of the power comes from wind, solar, or hydropower. So there's no more operational carbon, uh, you know, so there's no more carbon dioxide emissions from that facility, you know, even on a, you know, on a, on a local level, that's already there, right? Like it's like an electric car, but how you charge your electric car makes a difference, right? Like if you have solar panels charging your electric cars, that makes a difference than if you are charging it from a coal fired power plant, right? Uh, right. right. So this is the same principle. Um, we see also uh, the regulatory agencies pushing for it now slowly, but surely. Oshpad, the, which regulates, um, which is kind of the building department and building police for all of healthcare work in California. Um, they had, I sat on a committee that um, looked at the benefits of a microgrid, which is um, the ability to have a facility be autonomous. So that means like a rural hospital, for example, that is uh, you know, connected to a fairly unreliable power grid because there's wildfires in the mountains and stuff like that. And so this can go down for like months, right? Like um, those hospitals, it would be good for them if they don't have to rely on that power from the grid, right? Like so they can have either generators or solar panels or fuel cells that would then make them still be able to operate at least at some level, you know? And so right. that trend is kind of progressing uh, into the cities. Uh, it's a really interesting. I, I think that's a very good development, which is also more efficient. Right? Yeah, uh, our house, uh, we have solar and batteries, and I think we could 
disconnect from the grid. From the grid, yeah. And, That's the same yeah. thing. Yeah, totally fine. Um, and it it seems like, geez, if if as a country you could move towards doing that, you're you become so much more stable and and independent, yes. which seems like that would be a good thing, right? It right. would be a good thing. Yes. <laughs> the the devil's in the details in there, though. Like we were saying earlier, like okay, but where where do you source you know the the chemicals for your batteries and the chemicals for your solar panels and and all the batteries and the things that you use and everything else. Hopefully, uh, our technology and our means of making these things become equitable, fair, and not predatory over over the next few decades, hopefully, so. Yeah, there's an environmental cost for everything, right? Like, so there's, uh, no matter what you do, um, there's a price that has to be paid. It's just a matter of, like, what's the bigger damage, right? Uh, right. Right. Yeah. That's, um, it's always a process of evaluation. But I'm excited and I look forward to the changes that I see in uh, the industry at large and also the policy that have been pushed. I mean, it's like, it's wonderful to see this, that there's actually really kind of big movement happening. You know, there's countries uh, that are still increasing their carbon footprint uh, uh, as of today. But, you know, the U.S. finally is kind of leveling off. Uh, and so, which has not been the case for decades. Right? I mean, what has been the driving force to prevent uh, more hospitals from doing this? Because especially in California with the seismic activity and everything else, it seems like quite a risk if you're bringing in anything like natural gas or, you know, even like diesel generators or anything else? Well, the diesel generators um, you still have to have. You can't like run okay. a facility. Uh, like because uh, okay. this facility uh, has still a large amount of diesel generators, but they don't, they're not used. Uh, they're only used in an emergency. Uh, right. If they right? Like so the, the, the regular, I, I think one of the things that, prevents facilities from um, from doing this, there's is a physical constraints because uh, you have to have a fairly good amount of room in your central plant to accommodate heat uh, exchange equipment. And so there's, uh, it's from a physical footprint point of view, it's you need more room uh, in order to be all electric as a, uh, to have an all electric central plan. So that's one constraint. And then it's also a lot of facilities, they have existing infrastructure. And, and so to like rip all that out and then replace it can be really difficult, uh, right? Like, because you keep, um, healthcare facilities are 24 seven. They run 24 seven, this never stops. Like. It's not like a house where you turn off the lights, go to bed, and everything is good, right? Like, so this is always going. And, uh, and that, that's hard to, like, you know, do surgery in a running central plan. Uh, and so that's why this is slower to transition. So when you build something new, then you maybe get the chance to do this. Right, and right. We, we will push for it. And... You have to have also the right engineering team and the right contractor. They, things have to fall into place to actually make this happen. Uh, so it's not an easy thing. And it will get easier over time because there will be more examples of it. Right? But this is literally, we uh, did uh, research. This is the first one, definitely nationally, and we're not sure in the world that has no more natural gas to make hot water, even in the kitchen. Okay, like there's no cooking with natural gas here. So it's all electric induction cooking. It's cool. Like it's like really amazing. They were really a great client like to do that. That's like uh, it's uh, pretty unusual, I would say. And the uh, the the carbon footprint by using natural gas, which 
is a lot easier for, or a lot of people prefer, but the, the CO2 emissions and just the, the carbon footprint with natural gas is pretty high, I imagine. Well, yeah, natural gas is, uh, uh, is a non-renewable resource, right? Like it's like gas for a car. Okay. It's the same thing, right? Like it's, yeah, it's like. Okay, so why not? On uh, top of it, it's it's not good for you, right? Like, like to like cook the, to be exposed to the emissions of it. There's it's not just carbon dioxide that burns, right? Like there's other impurities in it that also burn and particular matter that goes up in the air and that's all not good for you I mean, it's not right. as bad okay. as diesel but there's other things also that are you know you want a healthy environment that is not the right thing to do now why not uh the battery like with our house we can do a battery system with solar panels and it handles all of our load is it just that a hospital's load is so high that batteries are just out of price range yeah it's uh uh the load is enormous right okay yeah and so it's uh, it's not like your house right there's air conditioning running 24 7 and or needs to be cooled down to 55 degrees always and has to be super constant oh really yeah the huh. so they're very cold inside because uh uh, it helps with like slowing the metabolism of the patient uh, a lot of times. So, so there's there's ways they regulate the temperature in a while. That's it's procedure specific oftentimes. So there's you know enormous amount of air changes required uh, in an OR. So 20 times an hour the air in the entire place has to be changed out. That's mandated by the code. Uh, a patient room has six air changes, right? Like, so this is a much different animal than your, uh, than your house. The energy demand is, uh, uh, I would say one patient room that's 250 square foot has probably twice the energy consumption than your entire 2000 square foot house. Okay. Wow. <laughs> because of the, the regulatory Jeez. pressure. And you can yeah. mitigate that with smart engineering and stuff like that. You can take that down, but uh, that's still a much different animal than a residential right. structure right. or an office space or any of that. So what, why haven't more people gone with all electric? Is that there, there is it a higher upfront cost and just... It's, it's new. It's... Uh, yeah. So people don't know about it. Heat pump technology is at its infancy for the large scale that is needed to, for a big facility. There's only one provider right now that makes a heat pump that's large enough. So, uh, and that will come, you know, as the market de demands, but it's really, it's so brand new. That level of heat exchange technology, you can get a residential water heater for many years now that's heat exchange, right? Like that's an electric water heater that has a heat, a heat pump on it uh, or a, a dryer or like that technology exists for a while, but on that scale, it didn't. And what is the uh, increasing cost in, if, if you're looking hospital to hospital, is it kind of a 10% uptick in cost if you go all electric or is that uh, future proofing yourself in a sense? I would say down the road, I think the payback, and don't quote me if I get this wrong, but the payback on the system was five years because there's also a large okay. amount of energy savings associated with it because you're using the waste heat uh, and converting it into cooling and vice versa. So you're, you're able to kind of leverage uh, your heating and cooling cycle in a way that you can't do with a gas fired boiler plant. So you basically, you know, every cooling and heating cycle has also uh, an inefficiency to it that is eliminated by that system. And um, 
look at it this way. When you look at your refrigerator, right? Like your refrigerator is cold inside, but the outside gasket, for example, on a Sub-Zero refrigerator or depending on where the refrigerator header dumps the heat that comes out of the expansion of the and contraction of the gas and the heat exchange pump, right? Like uh -huh. that just goes into your house, right? Like that heat that the refrigerator re generated in order to produce the cooling goes into your house and your air conditioning system or you open the window and it uh, escapes or your air yeah. conditioning system has to compensate for that. So that heat is now used to heat water. Right. Right. So you're now taking that heat and making, and that's a beautiful thing, right? Like, so now I take in something that typically just like burdens another system and leveraging it for, to make something else. Right, like right. very smart right. uh, way of treating that, right? Yeah, we did a very similar thing at our house where we put the hot water heater up in the attic. Uh, that way, all the it's already it hot. Does, yeah, already go up. The attic's pretty hot, and it pulls hot air out of the attic and makes hot water out of it and distributes it back down to us. So, my wife was on top of all of that stuff and really kind of got all this stuff just right. Similar yeah. principle, yeah. right? Like, so, um, so that's a good thing to do, right? Like, so you're, and particularly in a hospital, you have to have uh, process steam for sterilization and other processes. Oh. Oh. And that is a huge amount of heat that you have to generate, right? Like, so that's typically what the boiler plant is used for to a large extent. And so you don't have to do that anymore that way. And it's uh, it's great i mean it's a it's a good way how long has the hospital been open and has there been any difficulty in the management uh, uh, it's under construction or use it. it's under construction okay. they, they're commissioning the okay. central plant right now so they're running the first uh test on the system so far so good i haven't heard anything bad um uh, so i i think it'll be fine uh but time will tell and in most hospitals, they use their primary source of energy. Is it usually some kind of natural gas generation system to provide that amount, provide that amount of it's, power? It's both. It's it's uh, it's oh. it's electrical power, and uh, okay. and and natural gas. That's the typical right, so makeup. And then there's a there's always generators, and they they can they typically have to be. In California, diesel because that's the, you can't use natural gas for the generators because they are um, that storage can be that there's no storage for natural gas and you have to provide now I think 72 hours of uninterrupted service at a hospital that means you have to store all your water from sewage you have to provide water uh, for the facility for 72 hours and power for 72 hours. So you have to store all the diesel fuel. So every hospital has a bunch of stuff underground that are tanks for water and sewers, uh, sewage and, and diesel fuel. And that's not going away uh, with this. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. it's, uh, the the day to day those things are not used right like it's only in an emergency when an earthquake hits and the power grid and the water lines go down get separated and you know it's, it's uh and that's different in every part of the country there's different legislation for it so california being very stringent about it are you familiar with the uh, the update to the medical facility that went on in Loma Linda uh, inland from you guys there? A little bit. Uh, our competition did that. I, I think it's a, very, oh, okay. it's a very nice hospital. I don't know if they, I don't, I think that still has a traditional central plant. Yeah, I didn't hear anything about electric or anything with that. I think the building is all yeah. base isolated from what I understand. So that's maybe pretty unusual. 
Yeah, they had to redo the whole thing. I'm I spend a lot of time out in California and I'm pretty familiar with that area and the the cost to do what they had to do just about sunk the whole organization, but they've come back out of that and it's going great. So that's it was a big bite to bite off and chew, but I think, always, it, I think so. they did it. I think they did it. Yeah, it's always it's very uh, tough. Like it's a, a very expensive thing to do. Uh, to round this out, let's talk about something that you're exceedingly passionate about, which I kind of have a representation on my shirt here. <laughs> <it's sailing. laughs> yeah, accidentally, I just kind of saw that. But um, how do you combine, and what do you learn from sailing? that applies to the rest of your life, applies to your design life, applies to your business life? What do you learn from sailing? I'm not a big sailor, Trent. I'm, uh, I like doing it. Uh, I just did it and I was at a wedding in the Caribbean and I sailed. I haven't held the boat in a long time. So I was like, oh, I was a little nervous, but I did fine. You know, like uh, I think what it does teach me is uh, respect for nature and like how quickly things can go wrong if you don't pay attention uh, it's a very it's a complex exercise even on a small boat uh, and you have to really yeah. be your senses have to be really acute and you have to be very aware and you can't get distracted really especially if you're responsible for other people uh, and it's a centering experience and it's really feels, you know, you're alive when you get, when you step off the boat, it feels like you've done something that's kind of like a, it makes you feel very alive. Uh, it's kind of, you're a little bit jittery. It's like, it's like stepping off the motorcycle, you know, like it's a little bit like that, especially when there's a good breeze and like the boat has made good head and you know, like it's a, uh, uh, it's that I would say, I love that about it. Um, hearing, hearing you talk about that makes me think of it in a way that, um, I, I too enjoy sailing. I don't do a lot of it. I used to do a lot more of it and I taught sailing for a while when I was younger. Um, but it puts you at that point of being the, you are the actual bridge between problem and solution. Constantly. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. if you're a bad bridge, it goes bad really quick. <laughs> so you're forced to be present. You're forced to be uh, paying attention to everything that's there. And the, th the other thing that I got from sailing that I really appreciate was that once you're sailing, you're not doing anything else fast. Exactly, yes. Yeah. You can't get back to work. You can't get back to your family. You can't get back to the house. You can't do anything fast. You're forced to relax and be present and focus and solve that problem between, you know, problem and solution. And there, there's something very, it's like a situation that forces you to be meditative in some way that, that I think there's a lot to be learned in that process. And uh, I think it's something that people who are highly driven gravitate to maybe because it forces you to not be able to do anything other than that act. And y your mind can want to do so much more all at the same time. And it just makes you hone in on that one thing. To me, that was the, th the therapy within it for some reason. So, yeah, no, I 100% uh, agree. Uh, that's uh, it's, uh, it's a really nice thing to do. Well, that that's uh, most of, of everything that uh, I wanted to uh, extract from you for information, Fabian, today before I let you get back to being productive around other things there in Los Angeles. So <laughs> any, anything else you wanted to talk about before we go? Well, maybe the one thing to mention with the sailing, um, I'm part of a nonprofit called Sail to Shelter. And this was kind of like uh, a woman three years ago, Angela Abshir approached the firm and said, Hey, I have this stock of race boat sails and I don't know what to do with them, but I thought they would be a good thing to use for some level of shelter to make out of it. And she, she founded this nonprofit and approached the firm and our managing principal, Jenna, said, hey, maybe you would be interested. And so 
I've been working with her for like the past two and a half years. And we've come up with several projects of how to reuse sales. And so this kind of like trying to give back a little bit is really always a good thing. And um, you can be free to check it out. We've done like a little project for Lahaina and Hawaii and like uh, all over the globe. She's been sending some of those sales around and it's been really kind of fascinating and we're still working on a prototype that we can make in a way that it can be erected anywhere with very few means right like so we're working on like this little connector piece that can make this tp like structure out of any scale sale uh, by just a few simple steps that somebody can execute no matter where they are so oh, that's cool so these are kind of like temporary structures that you could use in disaster areas, refugee situations, San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it's not meant uh, to be homeless shelter because I don't think that that's appropriate. Not long term. No, it's not the right solution, but it is certainly a good solution for emergency situations, right? Like, and there's yeah. many concepts that can be used in order to reuse those very strong material right like it's a and and some of the sales get tossed after a year right somebody's spent two hundred fifty thousand dollars on a set of uh a set of sales and they only good for one season right like and wow. yeah so it's worthwhile yeah, to know. like find another use for that material right I remember going through a couple uh, buildings in Germany that were actually fabric fenestration, fabric um, uh, elevations, and they were the actual uh, substrate on the exterior of the buildings, which was really interesting. Do these uh, can these be applied in that way at all, or are they more will they degrade more over time? So they can't really be an architectural ap application, and more so a temporary disaster structure situation. You they might uh, the the fire uh, resistance of it is probably the biggest problem. Some of the types of you know synthetics used are very uh, they're not fire resistant at all. So they right. uh, others are you know like a Kevlar sail or something that has like not so much binder in it probably pretty good, but. I have, we've we've just started the research on what is good in, in what situation too, because we don't want to put something out there that is dangerous for people, right? That that wouldn't you generally get frowned upon for that. So yeah, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't want to do that. Cool. Well, Fabian, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today, and uh, enjoy your weekend in sunny California. We'll be thinking of you. I'm going to actually hit the road here in a couple of weeks and start driving out your direction to. Okay. To well, maybe we bit, can so. uh, we can touch base again. It would be nice to meet you in person, Trent. Uh, uh, where. I'd like to find out where the uh, hospital is exactly that you guys are constructing just from, you know, the adjacent lot to just see what's going on as we pass through or something. Happy to share it. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on today and have a great weekend.